doors falling off, tires flying off, fuel leakage, and a dead body. No, I'm not talking about my first car. I'm talking about Boeing. Yeah! All right, guys. Here's the latest on Boeing. The craziness started in January when a door plug blew out and the door literally flew out of the airplane. Alaska Airlines, Boeing 737 MAX, jetliner that was flying mid-flight, forced for an emergency landing. So what ended up happening was the FAA stepped in on January 10th. They initiated an investigation into Boeing's quality control system. Two weeks later, the FAA announced there will be no production rate increases of the 737 MAX until it is satisfied of full compliance. Now, March has been a crazy month for the company. Beware of the Ides of March. Five crazy incidents that have happened here, guys. On March 4th, Boeing 737 departing from Houston returned to make an emergency landing after one of the engines ingested and burnt up plastic wrap. Number two, on March 7th, a Boeing 777 leaving San Francisco for Osaka, Japan, made an emergency landing at LAX after the plane lost a tire. Event number three, March 8th, Boeing 737 MAX 8 veered off the runway in Houston, tilted up onto the grass. Number four, March 11th, a Boeing 777 from Sydney, Australia, flying to San Francisco, turned back after takeoff because the plane had a hydraulic leak. And number five, on March 14th, a Boeing 737 that took off from San Francisco and landed in Oregon, missing an external panel. All right, so to take the cake, a Boeing whistleblower, John Barnett, was found dead last week. He was a quality control manager for 30 years who was about to give a deposition. And he told a very close family friend, if something happens, it's not suicide. So a lot of crazy stuff going on here right now with Boeing. So as some background to Boeing, three things that I want you to know. Number one, it is one of the 30 companies included in the Dow Jones Industrial Average. It's considered to be an industrial bellwether. Number two, one third of Boeing's workforce is unionized and 67% of those workers have a contract coming up in September 2024 and July 2025. This is a very heavily regulated business and industry. Some of the end users are NASA, the FAA, DHS, so Federal Aviation Administration, Division of Homeland Security. These are government contracts, but that's a double-edged sword. It's good to have them, but they can pull the plug at any moment. The other thing is this business has lots of upfront costs, but you get paid at the end. So it's not an ideal business model. Number three, in 2023, 42% of the company's revenues were generated outside of the United States of America. And in an election year with a lot of uncertainty, that's a potential for liability. So what's the takeaway? As much as all this craziness is going on, all this wild information, Wall Street has Boeing undervalued. With a high of $300 per share, which is a 66% upside from here, and a low of $200 per share, which is a 10% upside from here. Lots of potential opportunity. All right, first thing we need to discuss, guys, is the balance sheet. Three takeaways here. So number one, the company has tons of cash, but it had significantly more before COVID. It had about $26 billion before COVID, but now it's at $16 billion, and it's been flat for the last three years. Number two, inventory is about 80 billion, which is massive. And they have so much money tied up in inventory. That's a huge opportunity cost there. And then number three, I'm calling it the death cross. Debt has doubled and retained earnings has been cut in half over the last five years. Takeaway, this is a highly levered company with a triple B minus credit rating that's barely investment grade. Let's check it out. All right, guys, a few takeaways here. As I mentioned, 26 billion of cash in 2020 during COVID, now about 16 billion, and it's been flat for the last three years. Another thing to notice, inventory is about $80 billion tied up in inventories. That's a lot of money. Also, just a fate of circumstance from the business model. So this is a liability. It's like a deferred revenue. So they ultimately have to perform before they can get paid. And they basically have 50 plus billion dollars that's just sitting there in limbo until they actually deliver on the contracts that they have. Here's the other sad part here, guys. Debt has basically doubled over the last five years while retained earnings has been cut in half. And then also, if there's not enough going on here, they also have a pension plan liability of about $6.5 billion. 
So not a lot of good things going on here with the balance sheet. All right, guys, next we have the income statement. So three takeaways here. Number one, revenue just got back to pre-COVID 2019 levels. So in 2023, they just got back to where they were at in 2019. And the crazy thing is they had over a hundred billion in revenues in 2018. They're not gonna be back to those levels until about 2026 based on my current estimates. Number two, gross margin is about 50% lower than it was in the 2017, 2018 timeframe. EBITDA has been negative three of the last four years and net income has been negative all of the last five years. Number three, interest income is less than interest expense, mainly because debt is about four times their cash balance. So what's the takeaway here? Business has very thin margins and it was just getting back on track in 2023 before all of the craziness that's occurred in 2024. Let's hop into the model. All right, guys, as I mentioned, 2018, they had over 100 billion of revenues, got slammed right before COVID and then really decimated during COVID. You can see in 2019, they had 76 billion of revenues. They just got back above that in 2023. They're not gonna be back to 2018 levels until 2026. EBITDA has been negative three out of the last four years. Interest expense is greater than interest income. Net income has been negative for the last five years. So not too promising here on the income statement. Hey guys, if you're enjoying this, please smash that like button. All right, the next thing that we have to talk about, the cash flow statement, which is the most important of the three financial statements. So three things that we want to discuss here. Number one, free cash flow has been positive the last two years, going from 2.3 to 4.4 billion after being negative from 2019 through 2021. So that's a positive. Number two, 2019 through 2021, they took on about 44 billion of debt that they're still digging out of. Number three, and this one's a major negative, they suspended their dividend during COVID and they never brought it back. This is a massive negative signal. So what's the takeaway here? 17.9 billion of debt has to be paid off over the next three years. And the model as it currently stands is showing a deficit in the out years, which is gonna require more debt via a revolving credit facility. All right, guys, some of the things that I mentioned here. So we have uh, free cash flow, which is operating minus uh, CapEx. So we can see that it went from 2.3 to 4.4 over the last couple of years, which is great because it had been negative from 2019 through 2021. This is where we have a major red flag. So during COVID, the company raised a significant amount of debt and they're still digging out from it. So you can see here on the net issued and paid, you have about $49.5 billion. We mentioned right here that $17.9 billion is going to have to be paid over the next three years. Also, we could see the suspension of the dividend in 2020 and it has not come back. Now, this was another thing that I was talking about, guys. <laughs> if you look, based on the required cash balance that they have for their business, they're actually gonna be generating a revolving credit facility that they're gonna to have to pull on starting this upcoming year and going through the end of the model. So we would rather see that they're generating positive excess cash, but that's just not the case here. All right guys, next area of the model we're gonna talk about forecast drivers. So a few things to note here. Revenue growth, about 10%. Cost of goods sold is about 85% of revenues, which means there's very thin margins. This is a very tough cost structure, very capital intensive business. If you look pre-COVID to today, accrued liabilities have been doubled compared to where they were pre-COVID. And then number three, advanced billings. So that's that concept in the business where they have to generate a liability, like a deferred revenue, because they're not gonna receive the money until later on. And that's about 50% higher than it was pre-COVID. All right, guys, here, as I mentioned, we have some forecast drivers I want you to focus on here. Revenue growth, about 10% on a going forward basis. Cost of goods sold as a percentage of revenue, very high, 85%. It has been declining since COVID, which is a positive, but it's still higher than it was pre-COVID. Next, if we look at inventory as a percentage of cost of goods sold, we could see that it's super high. It's over 100% and pre-COVID, it was about 80%. So it's on the way down, which is positive, but it's still nowhere near it was before. Accrued liabilities as a percentage of revenues, you could see it's about double what it was pre-COVID. 
advance in progress billings as a percentage of revenues, you can see that's about 50% higher than it was pre-COVID. All right, next thing we need to discuss, DCF assumptions. So with a high beta, we have very high volatility. This is a very high beta business. You can imagine the ebbs and flows of a business like this. Number two, this is a very highly levered business and it has a crummy credit rating, triple B minus. So it's barely investment grade, it's almost junk. Number three, one third of the capital structure is debt. And that's actually ironically a positive. It reduces the discount rate, the weighted average cost of capital, which should result in a better valuation. All right, guys, DCF assumption. So we've got our risk-free rate. We're using a five-year risk-free rate because it's a five-year model. Beta, pretty high here. You can see it's about 1.5 across all the different resources. Equity market risk premium, 4.18 gives us a cost of equity capital asset pricing model 10.57. We have a pre-tax cost of debt 5.91. It's a spread of about 1.61 over the risk-free rate. You could see it's a stable outlook as of July 2023 and it was last reviewed in August. Effective tax rate, marginal corporate tax rate 21%. Post-tax cost of debt, 4.67%. As I mentioned, about a third of the capital structure is debt. The balance is equity. It gives us an actual not so bad weighted average cost of capital, about 8.7%. If we come down here, we see that the cash, pretty decent, almost $16 billion. Another thing I want you to focus on here, guys, the terminal EBITDA multiple. The comps are at about 22.9, so I went with 23 times for the terminal EBITDA multiple. We talked about terminal value in the past. That's gonna be the bulk of the value of the model. Because the moment we've all been waiting for, the DCF valuation and the sensitivity analysis. So three things you're going to notice here, this company is significantly overvalued. Now, some of you might be thinking, oh, is this a potential short? I would not say so. There's only 2% short interest and typically with shorts, you need some sort of a catalyst, which I don't see going on right here. There's massive uncertainty. A lot of bad news is already priced in. It's only $5 off its 52 week low. It's actually 48% or $86 off of its 52 week high of 267.54. So what's the takeaway? Even with rosy revenue growth, you're gonna see if I increase the revenue growth from 10% to 15%, if I reduce the WAC from 8.7 to 6.7, it's actually at about today's value. Let's hop in the model. So we have EBIT, strip out the cash taxes. We have EBIT or NOPAT, we add back DNA. We have the changes in operating working capital, CapEx, that gives us our free cash flow to the firm. Terminal value, remember that's 23 times the terminal EBITDA. We get our cash flows to discount and then the discount factors. Brings us over to here, we have a total enterprise value of 107.8 billion. We subtract out the debt, we add the cash, subtract non-controlling interest, add associate investments. That gives us an intrinsic equity value of $72.5 billion. We have shares outstanding of 610 million. That gives us an implied share price or a value per share of 118.85. The current share price as of 19th close, the current share price as of the uh, March 19th close, 181.14, that gives us a premium of 52.4%. That's a sell. We never want to buy something for more than it actually is worth. We don't want to pay $181 for something that's worth about 119. Now, what I did, as always, is I built out a sensitivity analysis. This would be where we actually change the assumptions and see if the end result changes. So if we look right here, we see that if I increase the terminal multiple and decrease the weighted average cost of capital, so right here and right here, we still end up getting a value that's below what it's currently trading at. So it's currently trading at 181 bucks. We're still below it. What if, I increase the revenue growth 50% from 10 to 15% and still reduce the weighted average cost of capital, we get right around what the stock is currently trading at. So not really that appealing for us, even if we change the assumptions significantly to the positive. All right, guys, so what's the wrap here? So number one, Wall Street has Boeing undervalued with a high of $300 and a low of $200. At 300, that's 66% upside. At 200, that's 10% upside. Number two, personally, I think this is a very bad business model. If you think about it, you don't want to do all the work and have all the expenses up front and get paid on the back end. You'd actually want the opposite, get paid up front and then end up producing the good or service. So there's actually better potential opportunities with airline carriers than airplane makers. 
So think about it, what happens? We book a flight and then we actually receive the flight. So it's complete inverse in terms of a business model. Now, there are only a few players in this specific space, <clears throat> building of airplanes, but it's not an enticing area for me personally. Now, I have a special offer for you guys. If you wanna see me build a model for a particular company, pop it into the comments below. Whichever gets upvoted the most is what I will do. Some folks have mentioned Palantir, Microsoft, Hermes, Ferrari, but I will let the people decide. And if you would like to see what a good business model looks like, check out my NVIDIA model right here or my Tesla model right here. And as always, guys, be relentless.